All right, welcome to the Monday edition of the On The Tape podcast. I am Dan Nathan, joined in studio by Liz Young. She is EY from SoFi. That would be the head market strategist over there at SoFi. And of course, Guy Adami. Welcome, folks. Hello. What up? We got a lot to do. Um, Guy and I had an amazing conversation last week with Arsani Williams. That would be Dr. Arsani Williams. He runs Logos Capital. We had a great conversation about his investing process as it relates to the biotech industry. We talked GLP-1s. We talked about investing in and around them. We talked about the interest rate environment and what that meant for the biotech space and what it might mean in a different rate environment going forward. Um, you don't want to miss that. That was a great conversation. Guy Adami was in locked and loaded uh, on that one there and really enjoyed that. Um, we also have a ton to do right now. Um, I don't know if you caught what went on in the markets, guys, uh, on Friday, but it was the Powell pushback, I guess yeah. that was what the headline was all weekend. And no one seemed to care because they ran the worst crap, okay? And it felt like kind of into year end, new money coming in for the first day of the month and the like. We have gold, guys, gold making new all-time highs. The Bitcoin touching 42,000. The laser eyes are back. Of course, China, China, China. Barons, guys, I don't know if you caught Barons. We're going to do a little thing on Barons. They give AI the cover treatment in, in a big, big way, which I thought was really interesting. And Liz, you might find this interesting. It is the comeback of the 6040. It had the best, the 6040 portfolio That's right. had the best month guy in 30 years. All right. But we got to start with your pack because your pack is back. And that would be I think the we Green should Bay start Packers. and finish with the pack. No, well, let's just start with Above it. Above 500 think, yeah. in the wild card race. Crazy. I mean, the first, the opening drive, the first quarter yeah. was sensational. And Jordan Love has thrown a lot of Hail Marys. I love me a good Hail Mary. Yeah. None of them have landed really until now. <laughs> he threw one last night. I think it was middle of the third quarter and everybody in Wisconsin held their breath and it was caught and we were on our way. So I am elated today. I hope Taylor Swift enjoyed her. I think it was her second visit to Lambeau. Oh, I hope really? she enjoyed it. So you're it. saying that sarcastically. No, no, no. I, I mean that sincerely. Yeah. I think it's the best stadium in the world. I hope she enjoyed it again, but I'm glad that we came away with the double. Cut, guy, title town, baby. It was a rematch of, you were there, weren't you? It was the very first, um, you know, Super Bowl, Super wasn't Bowl. it? Yeah, yeah. Chiefs, yeah, that was Hank Stram, yeah. Vince Lombardi. By yeah. the way, Vince Lombardi uh, <laughs> went to Fordham University. He was one of the seven blocks of granite but i did not know i will that. tell you just to so, yeah thank you just to sort of emphasize and sort of layer time upon that jordan love is growing up right before our very eyes and all of a sudden you see why the packers made that pick pissed off aaron Rodgers. but there has to be a succession plan and it maybe it took longer than packer fans wanted mm -hmm. but it's it's a coming of age and it's going to be interesting on monday night football a week from today, the Packers of Green Bay traveled to the shithole of the Meadowlands <laughs> to play the Giants. That should be a fun game. All right. Let, let, I say that because before we get – it's been voted by just about anybody that plays, watches, or has even heard of the NFL, the worst place yeah. in the history of mankind, deservedly so. I think we do a risk reversal trip to Lambeau next year. I would love that. That that would be epic. We'll make it happen. Right, that, I'm not the one right, with that's, the credit that's card. In the, that, that's, <laughs> that's in the cards. Scott, let's Great. talk about this really quickly because I think this, we were just chatting about this a little bit. We were talking about that Eagles hosting the San Francisco 49ers, a rematch of the NFC Championship. We obviously know the Eagles won and they went to lose to the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. But interestingly enough, we were talking about how dominant the Eagles looked in that first quarter. Okay, they came out and if you were doing in-game betting or this and that or whatever, you may, might have been dialing it up, right, a little bit, uh, you know, for the Eagles there. And then San Francisco, as you said, made some adjustments, and then they ended up just absolutely dominating on the road. But here's the thing I have to ask you guys, because we've been asked this question a lot, and we had a great conversation with Mike Wilson. He's the, obviously the chief strategist over at Morgan Stanley on Friday's pod. Um, you got to check that out, people, because we talked a lot about this interesting juxtaposition that Mike has been bearish for most of this year, his fundamental call on the economy has been playing out. His call on the markets has not been, okay, which is really interesting. But his clients, okay, out there, institutional clients, have voted him II number one for his spot. And I think that's really interesting. We spent a little time, Guy, talking about that. But we've been asked the question. Mike Wilson's been asked the question. When are you going to pivot 
Maybe you've been right on the economy. When is your market call going to pivot? And I want to make one point, Guy. You've been really right on the commodity complex. You've been right on the uh, interest rate complex. You've been right on parts of the stock market. You've been really right on gold and the like here. So when we talk about right and wrong, we try to be nuanced, Liz. We're going to talk to you a little bit on the sector front because you've obviously made a lot of nuanced calls. But if we're just looking at the monolith of the S&P 500, or really the S&P 7, do you know what I mean? It's a different story. And we try to make this point on many occasions that it reminds us a lot of late 2021 before what we had in 2022, which was an overall bear market. So my question for you, Guy, whether you're up there tapping your offensive coordinator in the air who's up above or this and that or whatever, how do you think about making in-game adjustments or in-season adjustments, that sort of thing? And, And are we, if we are just setting ourselves up to say, throw in the towel like lots of bullish strategists did this time last year, right? Like, think about that, right? At the lows, like, how does that happen? Like, you know, we see what happens to great coaches in the NFL when they do that. How do strategists or pundits or or investors like us, how do we do that in season, in game? Yeah. You know, I think sometimes people reverse engineer and they solve for what the market is doing. So the market's higher. So you try to find, you solve for that. Like, why is the market going higher? And then you back into the bullish thesis. But the reality is, if you're down 14 zip early in a game and you're basically your premise to win the game was run the football, run the football, you don't abandon that until you have to. And right now, you know, you feel like you're down 14 zip, yet you feel like you've been playing better than everybody else. Like I put something on Twitter last night and I believe this. I said there's so many really nasty things going on and it's across a broad swath of things, economic, geopolitical, all different things in terms of just the commodity sector the currency sector, obviously the bond market, yet the S&P 500 is masking all of that right now. And the the reality is, again, my opinion, at some point, that's going to pay the piper as well. So I'm not abandoning what is basically, if you think about it, so many of these things have come to fruition. The only thing that really hasn't is the performance of the broader market measured by the S&P 500. Because if you look under the surface, obviously a lot of things have come to pass that way. I'll tell you a couple of things that I've done in the last two or three weeks because the market has run so much because it feels like, oh, my gosh, well, how did I miss all of this? Right. And and it's it's outlook season. So I looked back at my 2023 outlook, which was titled this ends one way or another. It turned out it didn't end. And that mm-hmm. shock, that's probably the biggest shock to me this whole year is that it didn't end. I figured we would know by the end of this year whether or not we would have a recession to finish this cycle. It would take care of inflation. It didn't really matter what the answer was. It was just, I thought we would know. And here we are almost at the end of 2023. We still don't really know. The bulls might argue that we do know. We didn't have one. But the cycle has not reset yet. So I would say we don't know. One of the things that I've I've nuanced into some of the things that I've said is that I don't want to sound like I'm not recognizing that the market has rallied, right? You have to recognize that the market has rallied and that it is flying in the face of some of the bearish predictions, some of the bearish sentiment that that we have about the market and that many people have about the economy. But you have to look at what usually happens in late cycle behavior. And this is very, very typical of late cycle behavior. So maybe it's not so much a matter of saying, OK, the cycle is going to end next month, two months later, whatever, the first half of next year, maybe it's more about, yeah, we're still late cycle. I think we can all agree on that. It's a matter of how long does it take? How painful is it when we get to the end? Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. And and so if you are a bull, you're looking around and we've had a lot of conversations, even with bulls, but bullish strategist guy, you know, talking about this late cycle dynamics in the markets and, and what you likely see as far as in the major indices. And we've highlighted this on many occasions. I mean, you know, look at the equal eight S&P. Now it's up 6% on the year versus an S&P that's up 20% on the year. Look at small caps after rallying 11 or 12%. Now they're only up five or 6% on the year. They were trading horribly. They're still down more than 20% from those 2021 highs. Then you could look at it the flip side of that. You could say, well, crude oil was trading at $95 two months ago, okay? And now it's trading at $73, okay? And it really just had got a huge head fake. And we'll talk about that later on in the week um, in Market Call, I think, a little bit. But look at the dollar, how much it's come in le- recently. Look at the 10-year yield at four and a quarter versus 5% a month and a half ago. I mean, there are some kind of bullish 
backdrops um, for this. But I, I want to go to Friday afternoon because I think this is really important. Fed Chair Powell was speaking, and we've talked about this. I think we talked about it last Monday on the pod, talking about the easing of financial conditions, right? And that's what really what we've seen, right, with, with rates coming in. And we've seen that flood into risk assets in a way. And I think it was interesting on a day that saw the S&P up maybe 60 basis points on Friday, first day of the month, like we said, and a day that we saw the NASDAQ up, you know, about the same or so, the ARK ETF was up 5%, okay? So with rates down, despite Powell saying, hey, listen, we might not be done. He's worried about the easing of financial conditions, Guy. What does that mean to you on the first day of the last month of the year after the best month we've had in stocks in a very, very long time that they are just crowding into the ARK crap? Well, I think about that. I mean, well, first of all, in a very one-dimensional way, it just goes to show that the ARC ETF is so basically beholden and contingent upon rates being low. If you think about all the stocks, the 10 stocks that comprise the top of her list or their list, yep. very interest rate sensitive names. I mean, there's no denying that most, if not all of those stocks topped out in the fall of 2021 into early 2022. Now, coincidentally, with the bond market starting to go the other way. So number one, if the only play with, for those stocks is if rates go lower, we're going to do well. Well, as you say, have at it. But two, to your point about Jerome Powell, it does. I'm sure it does not make him happy to see the stock market and risk assets do what they're doing in the face of what he's been saying. And I've said this for a while, and it's been a very one-dimensional thing. The market is saying, you know what? We don't care. We're going to get ahead of the rate cuts early next year. We're not going to sit around and wait for you to do it. We're going to start getting ahead of it now. And listen, it's been the right thing to do. But as Liz has pointed out a number of times, as Liz Ann Saunders said a couple of weeks ago, and to a certain extent what Mike Wilson said on the podcast, be careful what you wish for, because historically that's the exact wrong time to be buying stocks. Now, maybe they can gauge this and sort of thread that needle buying stocks and then getting out and pivoting into early next year. But next year, 2024, as poorly as 2023, I thought set up, I think that's what we're looking at 2024, if not a tad worse, given that I think unemployment is going to start to move in a very significant way to the upside. I've gotten a lot of things wrong this year, but one thing that I will absolutely say I got right in the last two to three months, mid-October, the market was pricing in the first cut being in July of next year. And I said, they're going to pull it forward. It's going to continue to come forward and it's going to come forward fast. It came forward a month, about two weeks later, after we got jobs data. Then it came forward another month in the CPI data. In the last two weeks, I believe I said something like, I will not be surprised if we've priced in the first cut in March before the end of this year. I sit here today looking at this screen, 65% chance of a cut in March. By the end of next year, five cuts. Yeah priced in. This has come forward so fast. And look at any chart about what the Fed does and when they do it. It's not the hikes, it's the cuts. And as those cuts get pulled forward more and more, the window of time between that last hike and the first cut continues to close. And that window is when the market tends to hold up pretty well. The market has held up pretty well. But when the market stops holding up well is when we approach that first cut. And especially immediately after that first cut is when pain usually comes to fruition. We're seeing signs of it. Guy, you posted on Twitter last night about gold. I said, I care. I do care because it matters. And actually, by the way, I'm going to name this podcast before we're even done recording it. And Guy, you're going to be proud of me for this one. How everything still turns to gold. I think that's the name of it. <laughs> Little Led Zeppelin. Oh to Led Zeppelin. There you go. <laughs> that, yeah, because it's something that the bulls will accuse people like us of ignoring the market. We look back at the bulls and say, well, how do you explain yield curve inversions? How do you explain rallies in gold? How do you explain that small caps can't get out of their way? How, there's a lot of things that are screaming caution. How do you explain the LEIs? How do you explain manufacturing PMI? I mean, I could go on and on and on. There are so many things adding up in that column. You have to pay attention. So we could have a little conundrum with Guy Adami because I have a feeling I'm in his head a little bit here. I was thinking maybe after the gold rush guy might have <laughs> been a little. So like in his, you got to understand Guy Adami's <laughs> <laughs> Very complicated. Uh -huh. Led Zeppelin, uh -huh. Neil Young. I mean, there is a battle going on in there. So we'll see how it shakes out. You're going to have to see if market, market call can have but, the other one. You know, I don't know yeah. if, can, if we can do this or not, if we could put it in the show notes. But what, is, what do you call when Spotify sends you the, the, the thing? Wrapped. The wrapped. The wrapped. 
the rap is yeah, that with yeah. a w or just an r yeah a w a w wrapped well i find myself for the second year in a row in the top one half of one percent of amazing. the global led zeppelin fans in the freaking world uh, and my top 10 bands you know it's interesting you know it's sort of you practice what you preach my top five bands this year have been led zeppelin bruce the who I want to say the Almond Brothers and the Rolling Stones, although the Beatles might have snuck in there. And that, I'm true to my word. Anyway, back to you. Now, and, and Neil Young can't be in there because he pulled his music years ago. Which is unfortunate because I will tell you that until you've heard Powderfinger live, yeah. you haven't lived. Hey, yeah. you know, and I just, this is just an aside because I saw the story this morning. Um, Spotify is having their third round of layoffs um, in. I think a year, and I think it's like to the tune of seventeen thousand. Okay, and and that that's that's a lot. You know, we we've been talking about you know the jobs picture and, and what's next to fall. And the headline that I saw on Bloomberg was like, listen, you know, as the company fights for profitability. I mean, these are things that we've talked about a lot. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. And I wonder as we get into the new year if we're going to see annualizing of some of the big cuts that we saw in tech and whether now it's time to do it again as they're losing pricing power and the like here, and so trying to defend those margins. So um, for whatever that's worth, I just want to hit on this really quickly. The average 60-40 portfolio, 60 stocks, 40 in bonds, did the best since 1991. Obviously, we know yields came in the fastest they probably ever came in on a percentage uh, without cuts, with actual you know cuts, and stocks ricocheted. And to your point, Liz, what happens next is that if yields were to come in, stocks don't participate because they're doing it, Guy, to your point, careful what you wish for. And I just want to make a point. This was from Market Watch a month ago, okay? A month ago. We're not in Kansas anymore. Why the 60-40 portfolio might be dead and what to do now. I mean, pretty fascinating sort of stuff if you want to bookend, you know, that that one month period, which brings me to Barron's. And I just, guys, I got to tell you, and I'm looking at it, I have it up right here. I don't get the magazine anymore, but if you go to Barron's.com and then you click on the magazine, you'll see what what is on the physical magazine. Okay, this is the, the headline. This is the cover. NVIDIA stock is still undervalued. So are these two smaller AI plays. The next story below it, Microsoft got an AI boost. It's far from over. Here's another story. PepsiCo is undervalued. It's time to snack on some shares. Buy this stock. It has 50 years of dividend growth, and there's more to come. Oh, here's another one. City CEO, how we're turning the bank around. I mean, like, the bullish stuff again and again. I mean, it's shocking. Like, like so there's no caution, and that, that's kind of my point. You know what I mean? And so this is the sort of stuff that a lot of folks, whether you're, in a, you know, in, uh, an advisor, whether you're, you know, some, some self-directed sort of, this is what you're fed all day long. You, you, know what, you know what I'm saying? And I guess my point about the strategist who kind of, you know, basically threw in the towel late last year, you know what I mean, when they were just through with the bear market, you know, like they defend Defended themselves the whole way down. All the barons, you know what I mean, stories were probably really negative on the lows at this time last year, guy. I mean, so just from a sentiment standpoint, I just think it's important not to get too caught up in some of this stuff. Liz just said it's outlook season, but a lot of these publications are trying to do the same sort of stuff. You and I, guy, are going to start drilling down on our acronyms for fast money in the not so distant future for 2024. Do you know what I'm saying? And yours is doing pretty well because Snap has gotten off the mat in a major way. So we'll see how that plays out. But, you know, Danny Moses talks about this. Elizabeth does as well. It's very difficult, especially in an environment where things are going higher, to be that voice that says, you know what, caution flag here. We think things are going lower. I mean, that I don't want to say career risk because that's a bit hyperbolic, but you put yourself out there on an island without question. And Barron's is not impervious to this as well. I mean, they have to sell publications or subscriptions or whatever it is they do. And I think history has taught us that if you're positive and effusive in your praise of things, you're probably going to be much better off, especially when you have a backdrop that's working for you. So I understand why you're bringing that up. I think it's a good point. And we could probably shoot holes in every single one of those arguments or articles that they have, but they're in the business of selling things as well. Now, again, I'm not trying to come here and say, you know, the negative thesis is the highbrow, the people that do all the work and sort of grind and look below the surface, because I don't think that's entirely true either. But I think you have to look all around you and say, okay, to Liz's point earlier, I understand why stocks are going higher, but these are the reasons why you should be concerned going forward. And by the way, 
Those reasons have been here this entire year. They haven't gone away. They've just progressively gotten a little bit worse. So I don't know how, at the end of the day, that can shake out positively for equities. One of the things that will always be true about markets is that you have to be careful when things are at extremes. Sentiment can also be at extremes. Now, this happens in bearish and bullish ways. But if you look at the main measure of sentiment, which is that AAII survey, so bears versus bulls, you can see it right now. And the bears are at a really, really low level. The bulls are at a really, really high level. That is a huge spread between Mm -hmm. that's an extreme. So no matter if the bears or the bulls flip directions, whoever ends up on top, the gap that is there right now is likely to close. It's likely to narrow. And I'm willing to bet that the bears come back in as soon as the market starts to turn down. To go back to a theme that we had at the top of the show, when you are either a player, a coach, doesn't matter, how do you reset the team? We know that my dad was a basketball coach for a very, very long time. Basketball is one of those games that a team gets on a run, right? They get into this scoring run. You can't stop them. If you're the opposing team, you're biting your nails like, oh, my God, slow this down. That coach usually calls a timeout. Full court press, maybe? You, say, you just change things up a well, little bit? Well, you do maybe call two, a timeout. Zone you, guy, maybe, you, you, maybe you, you ice do, them. Yeah, do right? something like you that. You slow them down. Yeah, okay. But if you're the coach that's with the team that's on a run, you absolutely do not call a timeout. You let it run. You let it keep going. You let it exhaust itself. You let the momentum keep running until the momentum is no longer there. We're in a place where the momentum is there. The momentum is there in growth stocks. Let it keep running. It will eventually exhaust itself. I think we're getting to a point where the extremes are coming in and it's it doesn't make a ton of sense anymore. And we're pricing in cuts sooner and sooner, which right now looks bullish. It won't look bullish forever. So let it I think you just let it run out of steam and it will. So so guy. Let me ask you this, switching gears a little bit. So this would be something that I I think we've heard a parade of bears for, you know, over 10 years talk about China and and ultimately, you know, how that kind of like like debt bubble that has been kind of just inflating. Ultimately, when it does burst, there will be major repercussions, you know, back here and and the like. And so here was an article in the Financial Times over the weekend. Chinese borrowers default in record numbers as economic crisis deepens. um, Defaults are at record highs. Look at this. A total of eight and a half million people. Most of them between the ages of 18 and 59 are officially blacklisted by authorities after missing payments on everything from home mortgages to business loans. And that doesn't even talk about like what's going on in, in, in um, the, you know, in the uh, commercial real estate space. I mean, like you know, Evergrande, it seems like there's headlines every you know weekend. We're talking about trillions of dollars in debt that, that seems like it's like on the brink of, of having defaults somewhere along the chain here. And, and I bring it up because, again, talking about letting it run out sooner or later, something has to give. Right. And so I just think about, you know, we spent a lot of time over the last few weeks talking about President Xi's visit here and how we met with all our, you know, kind of political luminaries and business luminaries. And they made a lot of sort of promises. Nothing's really come to pass. We're, we're seeing, you know, a bunch of funky stuff. You mentioned it again in your tweet. You know, you threw geopolitical in there, you know, the same way as we might have been worried into 2022 about what might happen with Russia and Ukraine. It feels like the closer we get to, you know, 2024 and maybe it's the election cycle here. Maybe it's a weak incumbent president. You know what I mean? Maybe it's it's the Chinese knowing that there are distractions in Europe. There are distractions in the Middle East that they might basically do any, you know, just something right that that causes greater tension between us and China at a time where their economy, you made this point, youth unemployment, all this stuff going on in, in the credit markets over there. Like, how do you distract their own people? How do you reinvigorate an economy that is in a deflationary spiral right now? And so I wonder if if risk assets here are not pricing a potential risk in China in 2024. There's no way. There's no way that risk assets here are. I mean, without question. I mean, Elizabeth can speak to this as well. I mean, what risk assets are pricing here, not only a soft landing, but the fact that we're going to pivot and recover in a way that probably we've never done historically. That's what the stock market and risk assets, I think, are saying. But I think below the surface, it's a much different story. And you're right. I don't think the market's pricing in any things that are going on in China at all. I think to the certain extent that trip that she made to the United States was, look, it's lip service. I know we championed it as this cooling of relations between U.S. and China. I mean, that's really not accurate at all, I don't think. Things have not improved at all. And if you go back and look, the four times prior that we sent people over to China, yes, the headlines coming back where we made progress, we're encouraged only to something to happen in the ensuing week or week and a half or two weeks after the visits. And I think 
to a certain extent, you're going to see the same thing here. China, let's just be crystal clear. They have no interest in seeing our economy do well, regardless of what you may read. They're in it for 50 years. We're typically in things for five minutes. And if they can somehow weaken the United States and our markets, it might hurt them in the short term. It will help them in the long term. So to answer your question, there is no way that a 4,600 S&P or wherever we're trading right now is pricing in the weakness in China and the subsequent things that can happen there. Liz, household debt as a percentage of GDP almost doubled over the past decade to 64% in China in September. Think about that. Youth unemployment uh, hit a record 21.3%. I mean, these are the sorts of numbers you say to yourself, it could only happen in a totalitarian regime where it's not bubbling up. Can you, you know what I mean? Like, like just some of the tension. So do you think, and again, I started this conversation by saying that folks have been warning about the risks of a Chinese, you know, sort of economic, you know, implosion for a very long time and not a whole heck of a lot has come to pass. Mm -hmm. But if I think back, guy, to 2018, you know, the Fed had to basically turn tide on their rate hiking cycle, okay, because there was a global growth scare and a lot of it had to do with China at the time. And we know 2015 and 16, a lot of volatility that we had in our markets was associated with China growth and, and the like here. So I'm curious, is is this something that you think we should be focused on as we head into the new year? Absolutely. I absolutely do. And and if you just if you dig deeper even under the surface of the S&P and look at the sector behavior this year, year to date, top sector infotech, nobody's surprised by that. Bottom sector utilities, the spread between them is 62 or 63 percent. That is huge. And if you think about just the the natural answer to this question, what are the sectors that are the most exposed to China in the U.S.? I'm going to go with tech and communications, right? Those are the top two sectors in the S&P right now. Unless somebody's going to argue with me that staples and utilities are very exposed to China, I don't think they are. But tech and communications, the most exposed, the best performing sector so far this year, the market is absolutely not pricing this in. And there's probably a lot more risk in those returns to give back just because China continues to heat up. Now, the youth unemployment rate is one thing. The household debt, I think, is much more concerning. This is something that I talk about a lot in the United States. And I know that our household debt compared to GDP, our household debt compared to income is not concerning right now. But the trends are headed in a concerning direction. And credit card debt, delinquencies in credit card debt, I read last week that most of those delinquencies are in younger borrowers. So if we're looking at any parallels, you've got a youth unemployment rate in China that's high and rising. You've got a household debt problem that's bubbling up. And now in the United States, we've got a debt concern mm -hmm. that is probably hitting younger borrowers harder than older borrowers. So there are parallels here. Maybe we are just later to the party. Yeah. This is a party I don't want to be at. Historically, people think that somehow lowering rates strengthens us. And I, I would push back and say, again, you know where I stood, you know, five, six years ago. But if we had kept rates, if we had stayed on that same trajectory, it would have been painful for a shorter period of time. I think we'd be, you can't prove the counterfactual, but I think we'd be much stronger right now if, in fact, we stayed that way. And I think the same thing is going to happen now. I think it would be a mistake to start to cut rates. I mean, that's what the market is clamoring for. The same way people that are working out are clamoring for a break, when in essence, they should continue to work out, fight through the pain, and you'll be stronger in the long run. I mean, th that might be a sloppy parallel, but it's absolutely true. Now's the time to fortify ourselves, not to weaken ourselves by lowering rates, again, my opinion. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And just to be fair with Barron's, there was an op-ed by a guy named Mark Chandler. That's Mark with a C. China's economy is shifting. The world isn't ready for it. And I thought this was interesting. Uh, economists argue that China's imbalance favoring investment over consumption threatens global prosperity. Conventional wisdom suggests that China should boost consumption. It can absorb more of its own surplus. This sounds right in the abstract, but in concrete terms, it seems environmentally and politically tone deaf. Um, it puts the U.S. in a position of telling other countries, what they can do to help uh, America and pushes the development model that is predicated on continued environmental degreg or degradation. I thought this was just interesting, like discussion about some of these changing dynamics, both, um, you know, like the, the deglobalization and our reliance on them and what the global economy relies on them for. We'll put that in the show notes. I thought that was um, kind of an interesting conversation. All right. Last thing we, before we get out of here, Guy, um, 
On the earnings front this week, we are not done. We're going to have Toll Brothers. We're going to have Dollar General. We're going to have Lulu. And I threw all of those three companies in there together because they all have the ability to say something very different about the U.S. economy or the U.S. consumer. Obviously, you know, the supply demand dynamics, the interest rate dynamics with mortgage rates. I mean, that's a story for Toll Brothers. They're more on the high end. Lulu, a bit of a consumer discretionary story or very much a, a, a consumer discretionary story. And then obviously Dollar General, uh, you know, we've been tracking what a lot of these dollar stores have been saying, Guy, how, how do you want to thread the needle between what your expectations are between those three com- uh, companies and their commentary? Because a lot of the commentary that we ha- heard out of retailers over the last couple of weeks was fairly cautious for the most part as we head into the holiday season and the new year. And think about when the commentary started to get cautious. It's when we started to hear from the dollar store, specifically Dollar General, but then Dollar Tree and five below. So in middle of September, maybe it was September 23rd, I think Dollar Gen made a three and a half, four year low, 105 or thereabouts ish. It's bounced since then. But their commentary, I think, is going to be consistent with what they've been seeing all along. And I think potentially it's going to scare some people. Lululemon on the other side of the coin is flirting with their all-time high. I think it was 475 or so that we made this time in 2021, effectively late November, early December of 2021. So keep an eye on that. If you're looking for a potential technical setup, Dan, and we'll talk to Carter about this, I'm sure, later in the week, the potential for a double top in Lululemon is very strong, especially given the run that it's had recently. So out of all of them, I'm really keen on hearing what Dollar Gen, the, not the, necessarily how the stock trades, but the commentary around the earnings release. Liz, on, on the home builders, you know, Toll Brothers in September, before S, before rates topped out, was basically at an all-time high. It looked like it was going to break out to a, a new high, then sold off 20%, okay, as yields went up to, you know, 5% or so. It's now since gone from basically 68 bucks to where it's trading right now at 88 bucks at an all time high. I, I mean, so the, the sentiment around home builders has just changed so dramatically in such such a short period of time. So um, is it just rates? Um, is it, you know what I mean? Um, is it the financial conditions have eased and, and, and maybe like consumers feel like they can finally, you know, make a move um, in this weird supply, di- di- su- in this weird uh, supply demand dynamic as it relates to housing? Home builders are like semiconductors. They're an indicator of cyclicality. They're an indicator of appetite for risk. And I do think most of it has to do with rates. As rates come down, housing is going to look more attractive. I think the other part of it, the other layer, is that the labor market is still strong. And we know that as long as the labor market is strong, consumers feel like they're allowed to spend and that they want to spend. And there have been a lot of consumers that maybe have wanted to purchase a house, but have held back because rates went up so much. If that appetite is still out there, and this is actually something that Josh Brown talks about, if that appetite is still out there and we've got so many younger families, new, newly married maybe, building a family, they want to buy a house, the appetite will be there as rates come down, which keeps prices elevated. The housing market, although we talk about it as an indicator pretty often, it's such a slow moving indicator that you can't use it as what would be considered a coincident indicator, right? So home builders are probably the only element of the housing market that can be used as a coincident indicator. As sentiment has risen, and as I just talked about that spread between bulls and bears, I would expect home builders to go up in that environment, and they have, but I would also expect them to come down just as quickly if that reverses. Yeah, I'll just say this. I I agree with that. And if if we do see unemployment tick up the way Guy suggests that it could once it gets above 4%, I do not think you're going to be wanting to buy home builders despite where yields have come in because it just feels like that is the last piece of this economic puzzle that we've been talking about for the better part of this year. All right, we covered a lot of ground here. We got a little football week 13 that was kind of interesting and how we tied it into like how we are thinking about the season that we are in in the markets here. So um, that was great. So appreciate the conversation, folks. Liz, you will be back with Guy and me on Market Call on Thursday. Carter Braxton Worth is going to be joining us. That is Monday through Thursday at the Risk Reversal Media YouTube page. So check it out. It's blowing up their people. And then Guy and I had a great conversation with Dr. Arsani William from Logos Capital. So stick around for that. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Guy. We'll see you on the Market Call.